Hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started since it is six o'clock. Folks might still be trickling in. So uh, we're going to go ahead and kick things off. So good evening and welcome to the People Powered Progress Building Change Outside the State House session. My name is Tasnim and I'm the Outreach Manager here at GBPI. We hope you've been enjoying this year's Insights Conference and have been able to attend the great panels that we've had available. And we're glad that you're taking the time out of your evening to join us now. During our hour together, uh, you're going to hear from some phenomenal panelists on how to make lasting change outside of the legislature. Before we get started, some quick housekeeping. Uh, transcription is available for this session, and you, in order to access it, look at the CC button at the bottom menu bar. It'll, it'll be your live transcription button. Also on the menu bar, you'll see the chat and Q&A features. Please use these liberally throughout our time together as we want to hear from you and our panelists look forward to answering your questions. Now that that's out of the way, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, let's begin with some introductions. Joining us tonight, we have Kiana Jones, Executive Administrator to the CEO at the New Georgia Project. We also have Stephanie Correas, Executive Director at Los Vecinos de Buford Highway. And finally, we have Julius Campbell, Life Navigator at Deep Center and founder of the Offender Alumni Association in Savannah. Um, I would love for each of you, if you could tell us a bit about yourselves. So starting with Kiana, can you tell us about yourself and your organization, please? Thank you so much for having me, Tasnam, and thank you to GBPI for putting on this amazing conference. My name is Kiana Jones, and I currently serve as the executive administrator to the CEO of New Georgia Project. Prior to moving into this role, I served as the lead organizer for childcare at New Georgia Project. I have been in childcare organizing for quite some time, education organizing overall, but I did a lot of work with Head Start, with uh, birth to pre-K age students. Also, I served as a member as a, of the Board of Education of the Borough of Roselle, New Jersey, as I lived in, New, in Roselle, New Jersey for quite some time. I have been building power in communities since 2005 what I found was that the power was really, really with the people. And when I knew that, I just began to mobilize and understand how to organize and activate people so that we could build the power among us to get the results that we wanted. That is awesome. And we are so glad that you're here to talk to us about that mobilization effort today. Um, so can we hear from Stephanie as well? Hello, everyone. Uh, hi, Tasdem. Thanks so much for having me. And thank you to GBPI uh, just for letting me share space and participate in tonight's panel. Uh, so I am the executive director of Los Vecinos of Buford Highway. Uh, Los Vecinos of Buford Highway is a nonprofit organization focused on uplifting the Buford Highway community, focused on empowering our immigrant families and creating futures within the, Bu I'm sorry, future leaders within the Buford Highway uh, corridor. And um, I've been the executive director now just for a little over a year. Prior to that, I was the development director for Los Vecinos of Buford Highway. Um, and I had just joined at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, went fully into fundraising mode so that we could help folks in Buford Highway get rental assistance and food assistance and just access to basic necessities so that you know we could um, live and thrive through the pandemic together. Uh, and uh, that is really, um, you know, my focus in nonprofit prior to that, I've been in the corporate world as a consultant, helping minority business owners, women owned businesses, um, get access to corporate contracts, government contracts, and have, um, you know, supplier diversity be something more than just a buzzword. Um, but I started my business in Las Vegas and I came back to Atlanta in 2018 and decided that I really wanted to be intentional about my work and that I wanted to give back to the community because I realized that so much of who I am today um, is because of where I came from and because of those roots and those things that were strengthened and fortified within me um, as a kid. So I wanted to be intentional about giving back. Um, and uh, got into Los Vecinos of Buford Highway and have grown so much from there. 
And, um, you know, we have been able to make such a difference in a little bit amount of time. You know, Vecinos has only been around since 2016. So it's very empowering um, and, you know, keeps my enthusiasm going as we keep, you know, working uh, forward and moving forward together. So again, thank you so much for having me here tonight. Absolutely. We are so glad to have you. And, you know, it's so great that you're doing the work that you're doing because Beaufort Highway is such an epicenter for culture here in Atlanta. So really grateful for your work. Uh, Julius, I'm directing that same question to you. Well, good evening to all of you. And again, thank you for GBPI for this opportunity. I'm a minister, motivational speaker, and mentor. And one of the reasons why I love doing the things that I do is because of where I came from. Uh, as the program director for OAA, Savannah or Offender Alumni Association, we are a part of a larger body. Uh, we make up Atlanta, Alabama, Albany, and Gaston and other areas. But what I love about what we do is we help men and women who have come home from incarceration, be it 20 years ago or 20 days ago. And we found that this was necessary. When we came home myself, uh, I did 26 years in the Georgia prison system. And I heard that there are multiple resources when you touch down, but that was not the case. Many people are not privy to those resources. And so what we believe is we needed to connect those dots. And what OAA does is they provide that safe space for connecting the dots for resources. And we do that not just in our area, but we try to do that in as many areas as we can. And as a result of that, I am so grateful for a deep center hiring me as a life navigator. And that is I help young men who are system impacted to navigate safely through the chaotic culture that we live in. So I'm doing both. On the right hand, helping system impacted adults, and on the left hand, helping system impacted youth. And doing that, we're able to help change the mindsets of those that are around us. So again, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much for joining us. It is truly commendable, the kind of work that you're doing and the guidance that you provide to young people returning into, into a into the midst of us. So thank you for your work. You're welcome. Uh, all right. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right into some questions. As a reminder to the audience, please do drop any questions you have in the Q&A as we do have time at the end for your questions. So the first question is for everyone. Uh, in the policy realm, many people tend to focus on state and federal legislatures as places to build change. Can you tell us where else we can build change? Um, we can start with uh, Stephanie. Um, certainly, yeah, we can start with me. I'd be glad to pick that off. Um, you know, one place uh, where we can build change is within our own neighborhoods. Um, and I say that because the work that we do with Vecinos is exactly that within our own neighborhoods. We work uh, throughout a network of apartment complexes throughout the Buford Highway corridor and that uh, goes through DeKalb uh, County, Gwinnett County, um, cities like Atlanta, Chambly, Brookhaven, Doraville. Um, and the thread the, the, that keeps us all alive and going are WhatsApp groups where we all come together and share ideas and share our needs and talk about our issues, talk about ways we can help each other. Um, and, you know, it really starts in our neighborhoods. Vecinos of Beaufort Highway was born out of, you know, I tell people gentrification. It's neighbors that came together because they were about to be evicted. They came home to a 30 day notice of you've got to go this building is you know now owned by somebody else and the new owner says you have to go um and because so many neighbors did not understand what was going on you know what their rights were what they were entitled to what they were up against um you know that's how this group was was born and um you know, we realize that coming together collectively and, you know, realizing that we have power and saying things out loud gives us even more power, um, you know, and just being able to rely on one on, on one another. And so learning together, learning how to not only advocate for ourselves, but to advocate for one another and, 
you know, learning basic things, a lot of, you know, a lot of the things that are out there, it's, um, you know, how the saying goes, when, when you know better, you do better. And oftentimes, a lot of things are just, we don't know. And so we can rely on one another, we can, you know, build community within our neighborhoods, within our own neighbors, within our own building, and collectively um, really affect change and come together and, and be empowered. Um, so I think that at a very, you know, granular local level, we can start with our neighborhoods. And from there, you know, we can get into our schools and our cities, but definitely starting just next door, you know, to the person that's right next to you is one way. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that wonderful answer. Can we hear from you next, Kiana? Absolutely. Building on where Stephanie began, right in our own neighborhoods, in an apartment complex within your homeowners association or your neighborhood association. Move right on up to your board of education. Move up to your city council. Move up to your county board of commissioners. If you're like me and you live in an unincorporated part of your county, then you're governed by a board of commissioners. Go to those commissioners meetings, find out what's going on, find out about your local NPU neighborhood planning unit. If you see gentrification happening and you don't like that, start with your NPU because they are the epicenter of all things redevelopment when it comes down to the places that we live. Start with your board of public utilities or as it is here in Georgia, the PSC. That's something that is a state level operation. However, we know that we elect those people. So when it comes down to it, everything that affects you in your home, there is an elected official that has some authority over that issue. And more likely than not, you're going to need to start right at your city council. If it's rent control that you need, if it's utility burdens that you're concerned about, start with those places that, that negotiate with your PSC. Start in the place that can pass an ordinance that would allow for rent control. Or in the very least, because in Georgia, there's actually a law that bars rent control, but at the very least, a city council or a county commission could implement protections for tenants. There is a tenant's bill of rights here in Georgia. So you can impress upon your city council, upon your county commission to protect the tenants and the citizens. If you're having issues in your school, hit up that board of education and don't be afraid to keep showing your face. I know that in some counties, like in DeKalb County, they actually ask you to tell what you wanna talk about before they'll list you for public comment. Put anything down there. Say that you want to commend the superintendent for a job well done. But when you get there, blow the lid off of it and let them know exactly what is going on, what brought you there, what affects your community, because it's going to take us showing up in those places that most directly and most immediately affect us in order for us to get the changes that we need. Sorry about that. I was still muted. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Kiana. Can we hear from you, Julius, on uh, how we can affect change? Absolutely. I believe that uh, I agree, first of all, with my sisters, but also I believe that the way we start is we build change in the hearts and the minds of the people. That's first. Why? Because most people think the way they think because of the narratives that they've been fed. Those narratives that have been fed is false narratives, especially when they believe that those of us that are coming out of incarceration are due to go right back in. That is not true. And I believe the way that we change the way that people think is by allowing them to hear new narratives. And how do you do that? by sharing your stories here at OAA. And uh, what we do, and I also have a podcast that we call Incarceration to Incorporation. We believe that you need to give people a platform to share their stories, stories of success on how they are successful occupationally, relationally, educationally, organizationally, when they see that we are successful, that changes their mindset. And when their minds are changed, then their hearts are changed. And then I believe they'll begin to start moving and maneuvering in the direction that we all need to be in. And that is together. So that's where I believe change needs to be built first in the hearts and the minds of the people by changing the false narrative. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And can I just say, I am obsessed with the energy in this room right now. I love hearing from each of you. I'm, I'm loving the passion from each of you. Like it truly shows how much you care about the work that you do. Thank you. Um, but on that note, um, Julius, you've actually brought us to another question I had. I was going to ask it later, but this seems like the perfect time. Um, mm -hmm. Since you've mentioned the, you know, narratives that you're hearing, I'd love to actually hear, you know, as you're engaging with your respective communities, what kind of prevailing narratives or messages are you hearing that impact what decision makers may think about your community or your constituents and what they deserve? Well, sadly, the narratives that I'm hearing are fear. Uh, a lot of people in our community are fearful, but they're also ignorant. Now, I don't mean that in a bad word because ignorant doesn't have to have a negative connotation. Ignorant just simply means you don't know something. And so I've even talked to family members who have loved ones that are incarcerated and they don't know what's going on behind the wall, let alone if their loved ones are prepared to come outside to do better. So those narratives that we're hearing is fear. Uh, are they ready for this? Ignorance, I don't know what to do or how to do this. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to get a seat at the table to talk to the community, to talk to corrections, to talk to as many people as we can, especially the faith based community to let them know that, listen, there are men and women who are ready, who are renewed in their mind, who are rehabilitated, and they simply need assistance. And for those that are already on the outside, which we call returning citizens, we try to get them to share that narrative. Look, I have been married for a number of years. Look, I have my own organization. Look, I have my own job, my own business, and I've been working consistently for 10, 15 years. Uh, I, I'm even trying to do better in the community by mentoring young men and women. So to answer your question, the narrative is not always a positive one because the message that they're receiving is faulty. But when they begin to hear more positive stories, then it changes again their mind. And then as it changes their mind, then they're able to talk to legislators. They're able to talk to reentry organizations. They're able to assist in faith-based communities. And then we can begin to change our society. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, I cannot imagine how difficult it is having loved ones coming out of the carceral system and not having any idea how things work. Mm -hmm. um, that same question to either of you, and I will repeat the question because I know it was super long. Um, the question is, are there any prevailing narratives or messages which impact what decision makers think your community or your constituents deserve or any narratives that you're hearing about, you know, the communities that you serve? Absolutely. Mr. Julius, you are on fire tonight. And when I tell you that I feel that fire and I share that passion and energy, one thing that I hear a lot from people is entitlement. For some reason, legislators and those in positions of authority think that those in our communities who we serve, who we represent, who we build power amongst, that we feel entitled to something. And it's not even about entitlement, although we are entitled to the same privileges as everyone else, although we are entitled to live in pursuit of that life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, like our counterparts who don't have to think about the same issues that we think about, just because I'm darker and I'm Black. I shouldn't have to live in fear that my children are going to be accosted by law enforcement every time they leave home, even in schools, because there's a prevailing narrative that in the neighborhood where I live, we need cops in schools. I should not have to worry about the fact that my neighbors are going to be vilified when they go and apply for public assistance, although they have worked all their lives, paid into that very system for other people to take advantage of that system, and all they're asking for is food stamps to feed their children. We shouldn't have to worry about the narrative that because my income is lower than yours, my children don't deserve the same education. We should not have 
have to deal with the narrative that simply because my child has an accent and I come from a place that's a bit south of the border, I don't understand what's going on in my community and I don't know what we need. There is no way that you can tell me better than I know what it is that I need for my family and what my community is in need of. So when you say that you refuse to expand Medicaid because you think it's going to bankrupt us, we know that that's a lie and it's coded language because all that means is a lot of Black and Latino people are going to benefit and you don't want to provide health care for those children that you're making us have with your abortion ban. Like at the end of the day, let's call a spade a spade and let's get beyond the coded language because many of those narratives come in code. So when we talk about entitlement, when we talk about those who cheat the system, we won't talk about Tom Brady. We won't talk about Brett Favre. We won't talk about those in Fortune 500 companies who have frauded the IRS. We won't talk about those who've gotten PPP loans, celebrities no less, and won't even pay them back because they're white, but because I'm black, because I'm Latina, because I'm Native American, because I am an Alaska Native, I don't deserve that same privilege. All of these narratives, when we talk about low income communities or underserved communities, that underserved community is not only lacking in income, it's lacking in adequate education, it's lacking in adequate environmental assistance so that we have clean air, clean water to breathe, a clean environment for our children to play in. We are lacking in so many areas because of the narratives that people who share and enjoy privilege with each other but exclude us from it those narratives that they have among each other and the labels that they put on our communities fuel all of those negative narratives that they continue to perpetuate. Woo, all right, say it. I have, what am I supposed to say after that? <laughs> Um, so unfortunately, it seems like there's a little bit of a technical difficulty, which is uh, causing us to not be able to use the chat feature. Um, but folks, I see some of y'all are leaving your comments in the Q&A. Please keep doing that. I just want to share with you guys some of the comments that are being left here. Someone said, Kiana is on fire. I love it. No questions. Just a shout out to Julius representing. Powerful. Thank you all. So thank you for those answers, Stephanie. I want to make sure that you know we get your feedback before we move on to our next question. Yes, thank you. Um, hard to follow there, Kiana. <laughs> um, well, you know, one of the the narratives that always comes to mind because it's a strong one, um, it's Latinos don't show up. And I feel like you can insert that anywhere, you know, voting, Latinos don't show up, their kids' schools, Latinos don't show up, you know, things about keeping your neighborhood clean, Latinos don't show up, whatever it is, you can insert us anywhere. And, you know, that is what is said time and time again. And it does affect us because we do show up. And, you know, oftentimes what we don't realize is that you know, we're people that have come back leaving so much behind and there's so much trauma that goes into that. And there's so much of that drama that goes unaddressed. And some people are just a little scared to speak up or, you know, their English is not so perfect or you didn't speak to them in their language to begin with. So they're just there because, well, thank goodness they found out that something was, was going on and they showed up. You know, um, working for vecinos, we have that happen a lot, actually, you know, we have a lot of folks that will come to us and say, hey, we want to work with you guys, we want to partner with you guys, we see the amazing work that you're doing, and we want to get into the community. And our first question is always, are you talking to us? Are you listening to us? And oftentimes, both answers to that question is no. So, you know, overlooking us constantly, um, you know, and like I said, just assuming that we won't show up, that we're not as passionate, that we don't want to be here, that we don't work hard, you know, or that we're just to be here deserving enough, you know, that that should be good enough. Some of the conditions that we deal with, with some of the families that we represent are really horrible, inhumane conditions. If you saw them, you, you wouldn't understand how anyone could live like that. You would not 
understand how anyone could keep their kids in those types of situations, but you can understand, well, you know, it's safer than to not have a roof over your head. It's safer than to not be completely out in the cold. And when you see that these are people that are looking for help, that are looking to help themselves and are just being shut down time and time again, because you should be happy you're here. Isn't that enough? Isn't that good enough? You know, um, and overlooking that we all deserve dignity, just in essence, overlooking us. And I think that the number one narrative that affects us is that, that we don't show up. So if you keep telling yourselves that we're not showing up, the Latinos, Latinos, Hispanics, whatever, you know, if you keep saying that we don't show up, then you also keep tending to overlook us and you don't hear us when that happens. And we need to be heard, you know, mm -hmm. our voices matter and we need to be heard. Absolutely. <clears throat> you guys got me real emotional. Um, I come from a family of immigrants. So, you know, what you mentioned about the language barrier, like I can attest to how, how big of a, of a, of a deterrent, just the fact that, you know, we may not be able to communicate with the same languages, you know, if, and, and how dismissive folks can be when someone doesn't speak English as a first language. And when you're being spoken to, like, you don't know what you're talking about, like, you're stupid, why would you want to participate in that? So I totally hear where you're coming from about like, you know, immigrants and in, in, you know, for your constituency, Latinos being thought of as not showing up and not participating when all we want to do is participate in the way that is authentic to us. Uh, thank you guys for those incredible answers. My God, um, I want to read one more comment that has been left in our Q&A for us. Um, someone said, those deep hearted passions you all are expressing need to be heard from the housetops of all those in authority to make change. Uh, so thank you so much for all of those, those uh, answers. The next question I have for you, it's a, it's a little heavy and I know our conversation's already been kind of heavy, so prepare yourselves. Um, what do you think is the tension between grassroots and grass tops advocacy and how can grass tops organizations better support your work? Um, and I will open it up to whoever wants to answer that first. I'll go first. I'll go first with that. Um, what do I think are the tensions between the grass tops and grassroots? Two words come to mind. One is isolation and the other is ignorance. Now, again, let me qualify what I mean. Grass top organizations don't know what grassroots organizations are doing. And the reason why they don't know what they're doing is because, well, they're isolated. Uh, here, I don't, I don't wanna call names of organizations out, but one grass top organization might be receiving a lot of funds where a grassroots organization that is not well known is not receiving any funds. And I believe that that ignorance and that isolation is the tension between the two. If they were to come together and recognize that we are doing the same thing, I believe that we can begin to save and help and assist more people. Case in point, a lot of grassroots organizations are deep in the trenches. They are talking about in the neighborhoods, in the projects, in the school system. They are feeling the press of what's going on where a lot of grass top organizations, they may not know what uh, Miss Jones' son just did. They may not know the need of uh, Sister Sally that's on the corner. And so because there is a gap between the two of ignorance and isolation, then I believe that we are missing a lot of people. Uh, I wanna give you an example for Deep Center. I, I love to mention Deep because of some of the things that they're doing. When Deep hired me uh, because of my skill set and my lived experience, they wanted me to help mentor system impacted youth. But when they begin to understand the needs and the trauma that was being faced at home from the parents and the adults, they recognize we can't do it all, but we can help you do some of the things that we can't do. So you may have a grass top organization partnering with a grassroots organization, and now we're able to do more. OAA is something, I love what they're doing. OAA is a grassroots organization that is trying to come uh, I guess I want to use the word join together with grass top organization so that we don't miss anyone. So to say it in short, the tension is because of the ignorance and the isolation. We have a lot of silos 
and that is our problem. But when we begin to recognize what all the other organizations are doing, and then we begin to come together, hold hands quicker, then we'll save more lives. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that answer. You're right. We each have our lanes, but that doesn't mean we can't reach across them to help each other. Right. Kiana, I see you've unmuted. Do you want to go next? Yes. Just want to go ahead and stack upon what Mr. Julius has laid the foundation for one of the main causes of tension between grassroots organizations and grass tops organization is organizations is the competition for funding. We know that none of us can do what we do without funding. We all need money to get along, whether we need a little bit right now, or we need a lot of it later, or we need a constant stream coming in, we all need money. And a lot of times that competition for funding is what will keep us from working together. It's what will keep us from understanding as grass tops organizations what it is that grassroots organizations are really doing and how they're impacting the community. It will keep us as grass tops organizations from doing micro grants to grassroots organizations that are really down in the trenches and have the heart of the people. It will keep many organizations from doing really great work simply because we're both competing for the same pot of money. The other thing that causes a lot of tension between grassroots and grass tops is performative gestures. I looked out as I walked down Auburn Avenue on the Dr. King holiday and we were doing the annual commemorative march. I saw a lot of organizations and a lot of people out there marching to commemorate Dr. King who will not support a local organization that's marching for voting rights on any other day. They will not support an activity that a grassroots organization is doing in community, even with the smallest donation, just so that the community that's being served can have the best possible experience. Many times when it comes down to it, the grass tops are looking for name recognition. They're looking to do something just to check a box, but grassroots are really there to plant roots in the community and to build power in the community. Grassroots organiza organizations care about what happens after the action is done. Grassroots organizations care what happens after we go to the city council meeting to lobby for a particular piece of legislation for a resolution or an ordinance. Grass tops organizations, unfortunately, many times will just say, hey, we showed up, we gave to this, we care about voting rights, but they really can't tell you anything about where that fight is currently on the ground. When it comes down to it, grassroots and grass tops have a disagreement about what's real. Grassroots know that the people are real. Grassroots know that the mother who's coming and complaining because there are no after school programs to be a bridge between when her child gets out of school and when she gets home from work, grassroots are going to address that right there in the community. Grass tops are going to give to the local chess club that might not even serve that community. That is the difference and that is where the tension lies between grass roots and grass tops because grass roots are willing to tell it like a T.I. is. Grass tops are going to make sure that their language is just so that they get that funding and they can go on into the next quarter and they may or may not do something that actually results in a win for the people. Oh, goodness gracious. You have such powerful words, Kiana. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Stephanie, over to you. <laughs> um, well, you know what? Uh, my When I was thinking about this question and I was thinking about my answer, it actually goes to both what Julius and Kiana said. Um, you know, and I was thinking originally about how there's a lot of tension because oftentimes, um, you know, what is overlooked are strengths, you know, the strengths of grassroots organizations. Oftentimes, you know, we think that grass tops or even grass tops organizations themselves like to think that they can do it all. And no, you can't, you know, actually no one can't. If you can do it all, then you're probably not doing anything very well. Um, and, you know, 
grassroots organizations thrive because they've built a trust within their communities that it's priceless. You know, that's more than anything money could ever buy to, to, to really gain somebody's trust for someone to allow you into their home, for someone to allow you into their life, for someone to entrust in you that you are going to help them or going to bring something of value to their life in some way, shape or form. That's a strength. That's a super strength and grassroots organizations. We, we all have them in our own unique ways. You know, we have our super, super strength. And I think that oftentimes these strengths are overlooked, you know, and again, um, you know, uh, this, that creates this, um, you know, competition for funding, because we all think that we're going for the same thing. I hate hearing, and maybe it's because I'm, I'm a salesperson at heart. That's my nature. That's what I do. You tell me no, and I will come back until I hear a yes, no's just keep me going. Um, but I know for sure that there's enough pie for everyone. I don't believe in the myth of, you know, funds being limited. Um, no, there's enough for everyone and we don't always all have to compete. That's also not true. Um, you know, and again, it's because we overlook our strengths because others overlook our strengths and think that, Hey, I can, I can, you know, take a snag at this all by myself and not realize that, there's others that we can collaborate, that when we come together and partner, we can be stronger, that we can be more effective, that we can be more efficient. Um, and, you know, the win-win can be bigger than just a win for me and a win for you. It can be a win for everyone across the board. And, you know, um, we can we can measure that. I mean, sometimes that's going to mean that we, you know, help hundreds and thousands of people. That's beautiful. That's amazing. Sometimes it's going to mean that we only, you know, help 10 or 20. That's also beautiful. That's also amazing because the purpose, the goal is all the same, right? To affect change, to help people, to help people grow, to help be, people be better. So I think when we focus on that and stop overlooking our strengths or having others overlook our strengths and, you know, build some sort of teamwork, um, learn to build partnerships, then then we'll do do better and not feel the need to to compete all the time. Absolutely, thank you so much for that. And it's so real what you said about us, you know, fighting for resources that seem finite when there's really plenty to go around because oppressive systems will have you believing that. Um, I want to read a couple of other comments left in our Q and A. Um, I'm I'm absolutely loving your cheerleaders here in the chat, so I want to make sure you guys are hearing this. So when, uh, when I posed the question, Cindy Battle said, oh, this is about to be lit. <laughs> um, then someone said, that's one of the other issues. Many grass tops organizations do not have any board members with lived experience, so they are sometimes removed from the issues. Someone said, we really waste a lot, oh, excuse me, Monica Wills Brown said, we really waste a lot of time not collaborating with one another. Tyron said, great points. Uh, we also have Cindy saying, Kiana, I am dead, get it. Um, someone anonymous said, can I get a witness, Reverends Julius and Kiana? Um, so we will move swiftly on to the next question. Uh, hopefully this one is a little, little, you know, a little more uplifting, a little happier. So each of you is very much boots on the ground with your communities, clearly, as we've heard throughout this evening. So I would love to know from you guys, what roles do you think community power plays in building change? And Stephanie, how about we start with you? Um, so community power plays a huge role in affecting change. Um, one, you know, starting simple, it, you know, a lot of people find their voice. You know, sometimes you need people around you to help you find your voice. Sometimes you don't know that you have it in you and it takes to someone else sitting next to you and saying, hey, I've shared that experience and I hear you and I agree with you and I'm here for you. And, you know, you feel empowered now. Um, you know, so that affects change at a, at a very small yet big level just within yourself. But, you know, going from that to, to, you know, now speaking to neighbors, now speaking to your neighborhood, now, you know, feeling, you know, it's been so great with us um, in Vecinos, we came back to doing our monthly dinners last year. Um, you know, we had a little bit of in-person going on, which we hadn't had through the pandemic. 
And so, you know, we started gathering together for our Know Your Right style dinners where we come together and talk about topics and empower one another. And it's been really amazing to watch the growth and the growth of the people that have been attending our dinners consistently because you go from, you know, just wanting to join, just wanting to get to know your neighbor to now you've learned a great lesson. Now you've found your voice. Now you can go and advocate for yourself. Now you can advocate for your kid at school. Um, you know, we've had a lot of moms that have been able to shift their children out of ESOL programming because they attended our workshops and now they know what to look for. And now they can go and say in their school, hey, my kid can read, can, can, can write, can speak really good English, and he deserves to be moved on. Um, you know, and again, you know, this is just from us coming together and finding our voice and, and learning that we can advocate for ourselves, we're learning that we can advocate for our children, learning that we can advocate for one another. So building that power within us, building that power within our communities, I think there's nothing like it, you know, um, you know, we're, we're going to keep showing up for each other, uh, bigger and louder um and you know that that's not going to get drowned out so i think it plays a huge role in affecting change it can start as small as in your household but you know like i said it can get as big as your community your city um and as as far as you want to take that absolutely thank you so much and it's funny that you mentioned the esl example because i was that esl kid in school and i wish my parents had the tools that you know that you mentioned so that, that really hits home for me. Uh, do either of you, uh, Kiana or Julius, want to pitch in on this one? Definitely. Building power in community is everything because the community is ours. When it comes down to it, the legislature is ours. The people who are in positions of authority are put there by us because we have the power to cast a vote that will put that person in a particular seat. And the reality of it also is that my work, Reverend Julius's work, Stephanie's work, the work of all of the people who do organizing in communities, our work might take us to another community. Our work might take us to another organization. Life could happen and I might have to actually relocate to another state. But if I have not built enough power in the community where I'm serving so that those community members can effectively advocate for themselves, I have failed them and I haven't organized at all. Organizing is about educating, advocating, mobilizing people. So we have to educate the community so that they can learn to advocate for themselves and mobilize each other. Then they can have activations of their own. They don't need me to say, hey, let's have a base meeting every Thursday night. They're organizing their own base meetings because they understand what power is. They understand that they have the power to affect positive change in their community. And they understand that it's their voices that matter the most. As an employee of New Georgia Project and New Georgia Project Action Fund, I don't live in all of the communities that I serve. However, the people who I organize in those communities are the ones who have the key to the city, the key to the council, the key to the commission, you know, that county, the key to the board of education. The keys are in their hands and they are the ones who can turn it whichever way they please. They just have to know that they have the power within themselves and within community to do it. Yes, there are strength in numbers, but I tell you what, one lighter can burn down a whole building because all it takes is one to get that fire started. If you ignite one, then the next thing you know, it's going to catch on to another and another and another and another. And that fire will be so big that nobody in a position of authority can extinguish it. When we understand what power really is and we harness the power that we have and leverage it to our advantage, we are unstoppable. Thank you so much, Kiana. I'm just going to say this. This is a silly thought I just had, but I have seen organizations spend thousands of dollars on consultants to like spend a year and a half getting to the conclusion that you just got to. So thank you for those words. Uh, Julius, over to you. Well, I won't even belabor the issue. I would simply say that community power is key, as she stated, because the legislators are supposed to be listening to the community. And I believe that they stopped. Why have they stopped? Because 
policy has become more important than people. And when the people start realizing the power that they have, community will begin to take over the legislator. They'll start listening again, and we can do the things that we want to do. But because policy has become more important than people, we messed up. Policy has become more important than people is such a quotable phrase. So thank you for those incredible words. I'm going to pop into the chat here again and see some of the things that are being said. Oh my God. Yes, Kiana. Yes. Love it. Yes, Kiana. Love your words. Someone gave me a quick compliment about my moderating. So thank you for that. <laughs> uh, we had a comment from our previous question where someone said the worst part is philanthropy supports supremacy and keeps giving to the same organizations expecting different results. I feel that in my soul. So we also have a lot of really great questions coming in from our attendees. So I can't wait to get to those. So, but so we can have time to get to it. I'm going to pop over to our next question, which is actually related to what you just said, Julius. So we're going to talk about how we define wins. So success, like you said, is often narrowly defined as bills passing or making movement. But in your work, how do you define wins or success? One returning citizen at a time. When a man or a woman comes home and they have an organization or a people group that is there to assist them, that is there to help them connect the dots, their transition back into society will be a lot smoother than it would be if they didn't have anyone. And that's why I believe that when organizations work together, we can change some things. That is my first answer, one returning citizen at a time. My second answer is this, by starting the conversation. I believe that's what wins look like. When you, be start, when you start getting people to talk about what we're talking about right now, then they're no longer ignorant. When you start getting people to talk about and start conversations like we are now, then they become passionate. They become empowered. Here at OAA, what we love to do is three things. We educate, we encourage, and we empower. The way that we educate is exactly what we're doing right now. Asking these hard questions and waiting on these answers and being intentional about applying them. And then not only do we educate, but we also encourage. We can do this. We can, this is doable. I really believe that it is. I don't think that we're just here wasting time. Even if legislation doesn't change, community can change and community can back us up. So we educate, we encourage, and then we begin to empower people. That's what success and wins look like. When we empower returning citizens, when we empower those that are marginalized, when we empower the minority, we empower them by allowing them to know that there are homes, there are healthcare, there is uh, all the things that we need is out there. We just need to help them to connect the dots. So that's what I believe that wins look like, even if legislature doesn't change, is one returning citizen at a time that is being successful and also by starting these conversations. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Stephanie, can I pass it over to you? Sure. Um, you know, for, for us, uh, defining wins also, I would have to say, goes along with just lives significantly touched, you know, whether that is we helped a family, um, you know, stay safe in their homes and they're out of eviction, you know, whether we empowered a family enough to, to advocate for themselves and, you know, to stay in their homes. Now they can keep paying rent, don't have to worry about their contract going out you know, or going back to, like I said, you know, that mom that attended our workshops and can now go into school and advocate for her kid and say, hey, you know, my kid doesn't need ESOL anymore and we can do, you know, we can do better. Um, it, it just goes by that, you know, by lives significantly touch, you know, sometimes it really is something major, you know, um, you know, we'll see things like people surviving fires, you know, especially when you're dealing in our cases with negligent landlords, fires are actually pretty common. Um, and you know, you come in at a at a time where people are are in much need and and you know just want support, want love, and just access to basic necessities, basic things, and you're there to to help them overcome that. Um, or you know, just it's through our workshops and our sessions, you know, where we empower folks where. You know, we learn a little bit about a different topic, you know, topic, you know, where we taught somebody the process of home ownership and now they can look to really owning their own home. Just 
things that are small and large, but again, significantly can touch somebody's lives. You know, uh, we really never know what someone's going through. We, we really never know, um, you know, why someone could be having a bad day. I know, um, you know, me as executive director with Vecinos, if you hang out with me or if you have a meeting with me on Buford Highway, you know, things might be a little hectic sometimes, get a little crazy. Sometimes people come up and talk to me and just ask for things. And, you know, I've given rides to the grocery store. I've given rides home. Um, you know, it, it just comes with doing the work, with being a part of the community, you know, and doing something for someone, helping someone, that that's a win. Whether it's big, small, that's a win. Absolutely. And I think we can each individual in this room attest to how that feels like a win to us when we can help someone. Um, so Kiana, over to you for your answer. Absolutely. Stephanie just said almost everything that I want to say. For me, a win is simply seeing something positive, any positive change in the lives of the people that we organize as a result of the work that we do, that is a win. And if I have successfully empowered the people who I organize, that is a win. And we need people to understand the difference between engagement and empowerment. Engagement is getting people involved and helping them be a part of something, but empowerment is giving people the necessary tools to make the decisions that impact their lives and to make a difference in those decisions. So if I have empowered you, then I believe that that is a win because we might never get the piece of legislation that we're pushing for. But if I make enough of an impact at that city council meeting that you know not to mess with me, <laughs> then that's a win for me. And that's all I want for my people. I want for those in authority to know that they are not the ones to be messed with because they will stand up and fight for their rights. They will fight for their neighbors. They will fight for the things that they deserve. If you know that if you mess with me, it's a problem, then I've won. And that's all I need. I want that on a t-shirt. If you mess with me, it's a problem. I want, I want to wear it everywhere. Um, okay, we have one more question for you guys before we go to our Q&A questions. Uh, and look, if it was up to me, we would go for another hour and I would keep asking you questions, but I know folks have things to do. So I would really appreciate it if you guys could give me a quick summation for this answer. Um, how can we better engage the community you serve in building solutions to the problems we face? How about we start with you, Julius? Thanks one more time. Sorry about that. How can we better engage the community that you serve in building solutions to the problems that we face? I think that we've said it throughout the course of this uh, interview, and that is um, to continue to be intentional. Um, go out and talk to people and let them know what's going on. Educate your community. Even if it's the faith-based community, uh, a lot of them don't know what's going on. You have a church on every corner that don't know anything that's going on with our judicial system. That's a problem. Um, you have uh, high stakes businesses and organizations that really don't know what's going on in the houses in the neighborhood that they're in. So I believe that the way that we can engage them is to let them know what's going on and then to be intentional about the solution that we have. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Stephanie, over to you. Uh, yeah, so I, you know, think for us, especially in the community that we serve, um, you know, asking questions first, not coming in, making assumptions, thinking that, you know, there are problems here and therefore, you know, we know how these problems need to be fixed. Um, you know, definitely ask, ask questions, be, be willing to hear, be willing to be open-minded, um, you know, also, you know, be willing to, to come more than halfway to, to, to really speak to folks, to speak to folks in their own language. I know, you know, especially when it comes to Latin America, we like to be placed in a monolith. People think that just you can blanket us into one statement. And no, you know, we come from different places. Um, we come, um, we speak different languages even. Um, so that, you know, realizing that, that it's not, um, you know, a, a, one, a one thing can fix it all for everyone. Um, and just also, you know, making sure that you center community, that 
you know, that the intentions are, are, are right. And finally, I would say funding money, the community needs money. So if ever you can do anything um, through some funding that would help, uh, of course, that, that would be best. Thank you so much. Uh, Kiana, closing it out with you. I'm telling you, Stephanie, you are in my head. First thing we have to do is ask the community what we need instead of tell them. And the next thing we need to do is connect their issues to our work. Wow, quick and straight to the point. I love it. Thank you guys so much. Um, all right, so we have five minutes and I'm gonna try to get to a couple of Q and A's at least. So thank you guys so much again for your time. And I, I wish y'all could see the Q&A right now because people are losing their minds over the answers that you guys have given tonight. Um, so there was one question we got that said, how do we engage people into civic engagement and advocacy? I hope that that question that we just asked answers that for you. Uh, if not, I highly recommend you reach out to uh, all three of these panelists in your free time because as you can see, they're great. Um, so the first question I will ask you guys is uh, somebody said, while I agree that we need to change the narrative, it's hard when the power structures are controlled by the other side. Do you think we should move away from policy change and move more towards mutual aid? And I will open it to anyone who wants to take it. I'm going to say that both have to go hand in hand. Mutual aid is a must because we know what our people need. And in times of real need, the community is usually the entity that steps up first, but we do need to follow it up with policy change. So I would say, while we don't have to completely abandon policy change, definitely, definitely mutual aid is a must. Policy change is key. There's a friend of mine that he often says that if policy doesn't change, then we're not doing anything. Uh, I don't agree 100% with that, but I do know that he has um, his finger on the pulse. Policy change is what holds up the mutual aspect of what we're talking about. So I believe that, again, they two go hand in hand, but policy change won't happen until the community starts saying something about it. Anything from you, Stephanie? Well, I was just going to say without believing that, you know, achieving policy change is possible, then this would just be a never ending cycle, you know, um, so we, we have to, we have to work towards that we have to believe in it. Otherwise, you know, it'll, it'll keep us stuck in the same place that we are. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. Uh, someone else asked, how can we change the narrative on the grass tops agenda? We need grass tops organizations to be about what they talk about. <laughs> we need grass tops organizations to stop, stop making performative gestures, but really get out here with the people. We need grass tops organizations to get off of their high horses and get down here with us, get down on the ground with us. And we're not talking about a bus tour through some cities during election season. We are talking about get down on the ground get with the people get your hands dirty because you're not too good that's what we need from grass tops organizations yes kiana i completely completely agree um you know enough like you said with what's performative and a lot more of coming in and wanting to hear wanting to find out really wanting to drill down to the nitty-gritty you know um uh I will say last year I had an experience where uh, I felt that more grass top organizations were making an actual effort to diversify who they were hiring. And because of you know, the diversification in their hiring, um, that led to me being in more rooms that I've not been in before last year. And I was very aware of the fact that that only happened because people that looked like me opened that door, you know? And so by, you know, grass tops being more intentional and actually wanting to, you know, affect change rather than just putting it on, you know, a mug or a, a social media meme, you know, but really doing the work that it takes uh, because it's not going to happen overnight. You're, you're, you as much money as you want to throw at it. You can't just come in one day and all of a sudden know everything that's wrong with the community or what's going on or pretend that you know. 
you know, you, you really need to talk to the folks that are out doing the work. Um, and so for that, you need folks that come from the field from doing the work. Um, and when you're intentional about, you know, seeking those people and putting those people in positions of power, that is when we actually affect change. And, you know, thanks to that, the, the mentality of, if I'm going, I'm bringing someone along with me, you know, and I am grateful to those that are bringing me along because then I can turn around and do the same thing. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. I wish we had more time together to get to the other questions that have been asked, but I really appreciate you guys all for you know, the answers that you've given. I want to give one last shout out. Someone said, thank you, Stephanie, for being a voice for our non-English speaking brothers and sisters. And the point about how changes at the grass tops can open doors for more diverse voices. Absolutely agree. Thank you all so much. So that is the end of our time. So again, another humongous, enormous, huge thank you to our panelists for joining us tonight and for your insights and your thoughts and your power and your energy. It is unparalleled. And what a great note to end the night on. And thank you everyone who joined us, not only for this session, but for those who got to see, we got to see at yesterday's reception and those who joined us for the panels throughout the day. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did and we can't wait to connect with y'all soon. We encourage you guys all to connect with the New Georgia Project, Los Vecinos de Buford Highway and the Deep Center as they are doing awesome things in the community as you heard. And please be sure to reach out to us at GBPI if you ever need anything. Thank you again and have a great evening.